Hi, Register for today, please do so with that QR code uh, behind you. It's important for us to get the numbers and then take the opportunity to visit our website where you can get our um, newsletter to get the other events that we organize. Um, we are very, very happy and honored to host today in our class speaker series um, Jose Antonio Sheibubi, who is the Andrew Mellon Chair uh, in the Department of Political Science here at PIP. He recently joined uh, the department and also recently became um, associated with, with the Center for Latin American Studies. So among several topics, um, Shea Ruby discussed the process of democratization and democracy. And today I think we're going to talk about a important and hopefully not depressing topic. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank, you. you. thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thank you all for being here. Um, this is the second time I'm giving a talk at PIP this year. This time I'm not trying to get a job. <laughs> so I decided to go with something more risky. And, uh, and so I'm gonna present this paper, which is really not, I mean, I, I enjoyed working on it and I like the topic, but it's really not in my comfort zone. I was thinking it's a very, it's a very historical uh, paper and has a lot of words. And I, is I think the second time I presented, and I'm I was afraid of forgetting there are lots of dates and things, so I packed the powerpoints and which is like what I tell my students rule number one for not giving a talk, but. You know, you make the rules and you break them, right? So, so this is a paper with Adam Shavorsky and Fernando Limongi, um, and it's about electing presidents. So, so, just jump into it. So, one view of democracy, standard view of democracy, is it is um, um, a system that has two components, right? Participation which is pretty much defined by the extent, extension of the extent of the suffrage and contestation. So the parties are in compete for votes from voters, from the people, and uh, uh, to in order to get to office. But there are systems in which those two conditions are met. There is contestation and there is participation, and yet the votes of voters do not determine who is going to be ruling them. And so this kind of violates one important uh, uh, principle of democracy. And you know, this, is, this happens because voting is not the same um, as electing. We know we political scientists and you know, other living, it's part of our business to know something about the effect of uh, 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 the votes on the um, outcome of um, elections. And these effects only happen when the individual wills or the aggregate, you know, the individual votes are aggregated into a collective decision. When it comes to legislative elections, we know a lot, and this is like the bread and butter of a lot of us political scientists. And we know that different rules matter. And we have, you know, we stood, there is a huge literature about the different dimensions of the electoral systems. You know, the formula, the structure of the districts from which people are, are elected, the magnitude of the district, the ballot structure, whether you vote for a party or if you vote for an individual, and a number of other relatively minor but nonetheless important aspects of any electoral system. We know from studying these dimensions that this different components of electoral systems have mechanical and strategic uh, a consequence. So mechanically, we know that uh, in, in, in parliamentary, in, in, well, in elections that are majoritarian, right, uh, manufactured majorities are more likely to happen. What does that mean? It means that 
some party won less than 50% of the votes, nonetheless won more than 50% of the seats. So this is a purely mechanical effect of how the votes are aggregated across the, the district and so on. And there are many others. And then there are others that are strategic, you know, about whether parties or candidates will choose to enter a certain kind of election and whether voters are going to vote uh, as people say sincerely or strategically. In other words, they'll choose a candidate that happens to not be the one that they, the voters most prefer. Again, we know how to combine this, these things. And finally, we know that the combination of these rules with a given distribution of preferences over uh, jurisdiction, over the space, is what determines the structure of representation and all sorts of things that we care about, whose voice is going to be heard in the political system, what kind of, how do real legislators behave once they are in the assembly, what kinds of policies will be passed you know, in, in, in broader strokes. Now, we know or worry, and the reason I say worry is because it is not an area, executives are not really an area that's privileged by democratic theory, for example. And this is, you know, beginning with the classic is something that's kind of almost an afterthought. But even if we worry, we know relatively less about presidential uh, elections and the rules of electing presidents and the effects that they have. So what we try to show in this paper is that these rules can have an even more direct effect when it comes to this democratic aspect in the sense that under some rules, you know, even in systems in which contestation happens and participation is broad, um, the people as a collectivity, they do not elect or choose those who are gonna govern them. Their uh, preferences, once aggregated, can be simply ignored or overruled. And so, of course, this violates a principle, you know, an important fundamental principle of democracy. So this is just the overview. See, that's what I meant, I mean, how packed this is. I'll try to not keep reading, but um, so anyway. So what we did in this paper is that we collect data about all presidential elections that happened since 1788, which was the very first one in the world, to 2020. And we examined first what these rules are, how and uh, uh, why they have changed, and whether they matter for some specific outcomes that I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, talk about a little later. We document the process of transformation of these rules over the 200 plus years that we uh, study of in the direction of increasing democratization. Broadly speaking, these rules went from a situation in which the final decision about who is going to be the head of the executive was not made by the voters, was made by somebody else, even if voters participated in the process, to a, a, a system in which the, 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 the voice of the voters were this, was decisive only to the extent that they some kind of criterion was met. And I'll explain what I mean by that. And then to the situation that is almost universal, almost pervasive in the world, in which the, fo the voice of the voters is decisive, that they decide who is going to be ruling um, them. We, we try to reflect a little bit about the reasons why and the, how, you know, the, the why and how these things change. And, and that's when the slides are going to get really packed. And then I'll talk about the outcome. But before we move on, let me go a little bit over this, this thing. So we let's start with the contemporary, the more contemporary world, right? When the, the voice of the voters are uh, is decided. So these are direct elections as we uh, understand that, aggregated at the national level. So we look at all cases in which, you know, voters vote and votes, votes are counted at the national level and given some rule then somebody is declared the winner. The, these rules are coming two varieties with some variations. They come in a, a one round vote in which the plurality rule is, is adopted, meaning that if you have four candidates competing for the vote, whoever gets the highest number of votes will be the winner. So that, if, you know, voters, their, their voice is decisive. If 
the you know one more than anybody else got the votes, that person becomes the, the winner. And then you have, which is the more common system now, the two-round votes in which voters vote. If nobody gets a majority, a relative, or depends on what the nominator is, but an absolute majority of votes, 50% plus one, then you have a second round. And in, the, in that second round, only the top two contenders uh, participate. And, and then necessarily somebody's going to come, unless there is a tie, somebody's going to come out, come out with a, a majority of votes. There are some variations, geographic distribution. So like in Kenya and Nigeria, they require that a certain, the, the winner candidate wins a, a certain plurality in some areas of the country. In Costa Rica and Argentina, the criterion is not majority, but it is plurality. So 45% in Argentina or 40% with 10% difference between the first and the second and so on and so forth. But the idea is the same. Now, the other one is when the voice of the voter is only conditionally decisive and I already know that I have to speed this up. And so that means that it is almost like the second it is a two round election in the sense that voters vote, some criterion has to be met if that usually uh, in the historical case is an absolute majority, if that criterion is not met, then the Congress or the assembly votes, uh, uh, chooses the winner. And that can happen in many conditions, either the top three candidates, the top two in the more contemporary forms, it has been the top two, actually the last case happened in Bolivia in 2005. And, and so no other country in the world used this kind of thing. And then, of course, there is the not decisive one in which, you know, what we call the indirect elections, and they also come in a variety of forms. They can be indirect in the sense that there is a set of primary voters who are, who choose, who vote for secondary voters or electors, and then these electors come together either ad hoc, you know, in a, in a meeting that happens just one day, or they come, they're part of a standing body that meets over three years, say, and whenever there is a need to elect some other national officer, and then they vote. And, and in DR, you can have cases, you know, many cases in which the election is made by the assembly that is already constituted, right? So that's what happens in so many parliamentary regimes today. Your voters vote for the assembly, and then the assembly comes together, and they decide to choose the, 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 the either the, or the indirectly elected president in that, in that sense. Now, obviously, the choice of the voters that they may or may not matter, right? They matter if they, you know, they produce a majority, but if, you know, actually they don't matter. The primary voters don't matter. Well, who, you know, it's either the secondary voters or the legislators, and they are free to do whatever they want. And that's the, the important thing to be taught there. Now, so th that's the basic distinction. I'm not going to spend time on this. You know, this is just the distribution by geographic areas, the distribution of you know of types of elections, and now it's the more interesting thing, which is just a description of the evolution over these 200 years. So here, you know, this not the, we don't have the credit side. We give this score for these kinds of elections, and then the average for each year for all elections for president happened. And of course, the higher the average, that means that we're going, you know, we have more plurality or, or two round elections, more decisive elections. And this is very obvious there that over the, the years, more and more of these elections are plurality. This is just the distribution of these elections uh, over these 200 plus years. You know, this is, is a, you know, a risk of plot. And this just shows that. You know, this type of election, one is electors, right? So an indirect election with electors. It was used by many countries in the 19th century, more, all of them in Latin America and the United States. And then today is only used by the United States. And that's the one of my work. Then we have the, the case of uh, um, legislative, um, legislature elected presidents. And it's interesting that, as you can see, they, they, you know, they concentrate in the 20th century because this is the these are the cases of the monarchies in Europe that became republics. 
and then they first uh, uh, elected the presidents indirectly. But it seems, I mean, here you have, you know, an interesting case is, um, 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 I mean, you have only three cases, very few cases in the Latin America of the 19th century, and that was, was Uruguay, Chile, and, and um, Ecuador. The only three countries, I mean, the three the, who had constitutions, I mean, because they all had, you know, local constitutions, that at some point had constitutions calling for an elect election by the legislature. And then this is interesting, the conditional uh, type of election was used in some Central American countries in Bolivia, but in Liberia since the mid 19th century, you know, all the way to when things fell apart in Liberia, so that they contribute a large number, but it's essentially a Latin American phenomenon. And then of course, the decisive direct and um, indirect election. Now this, and I just noticed that the label is wrong, so I'm, I'm just gonna, I, I, again, it shows the same thing, right? A sharp decline in indirect election with electors, a steep incline, uh, increase in direct, two-round direct elections, and, and that's actually the second line going to zero. This is conditional, which also disappeared. But again, the point in, I'm trying to go fast here because I want to talk about the other stuff. I'm going to skip this because the sense here is just to say that you know, here we just look at transitions, what kind of election the countries had and what kind of the, what kind of election was the next election, what kind of rules. The important thing is that you know, the vast majority of elections fall in the diagonal, meaning that they didn't change, you know, countries that adopted that kind of rule, you know, eventually they did. Most of the changes are in the direction of democratic of, of direct elections. There are few reversals. Very few. Some of them, obviously, as you can immediately imagine, have to do with coups. So in Brazil in 66, you know, the first election after the 1964 coup, you know, the rule was plurality election before, and then it went back to a congressional election. So, you know, it's kind of a reversal in this sense. All right. Now, and finally, this is the last figure. And this is an interesting one because here we're trying to distinguish very crudely, but parliamentary and presidential systems. So presidential systems are those, I mean, the reason being that, you know, you can say that parliamentary systems have presidents, like the German president exists or the Italian president, but they don't matter. So we want to try to distinguish a little bit between the cases in which the president has executive power or the sole executive power from the ones in which they have to share with the prime minister. And this is what we do here. And the interesting thing to see is that even among the cases of parliamentary systems in which the, the, the prime minister requires the confidence of the assembly, we see a rise, you know, steep increase in the direct election for presidents. All right, now, that's the upshot. I said it 500 times, so let's move on. Now, now we start to speculate a little bit, but guided by some research, by reading some constitutional debates, reading the secondary literature, and 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 so this is what we, you know, some thoughts that we had about this thing. The first thing is, you know, the presidency, well, you know, like anything else, we study is not a natural thing; it had to be invented, right? And it was invented in the United States, and the first presidential election was in 1788. Uh, at elected elect Washington. The interesting thing, you know, the, the point is that it wasn't inevitable. There is, a, particularly among political scientists, there is this idea that, you know, that the U.S. had a presidential election, it was the product of a very well thought process. Then Latin American countries became independent in the early 19th century, and they simply copied automatically what the U.S. had done. Well, it wasn't like that at all. To begin with, it wasn't a well thought process in the United States, right? The, the, the brilliant framers didn't frame the presidency or didn't give a lot of importance to framing the presidency or were not able to agree on what kind of presidency they were going to have. Every option that existed at that time, direct election, election by the Congress, and the election with electors, which is the one that eventually 
prevailed, they cycled, cycled between July and September during the, the Philadelphia Convention, and they voted, they approved, but they were not happy, and they came back. And they finally decided on the rules 13 days before the convention, the, before the constitution was, was signed. So it, it was like Dahl, Robert Dahl says that, Rakovi, who is a historian of the constitution, says that it was pretty much like a default situation, that they didn't have a better thing to put um, in place. Um, so at independence in Latin America, on the other hand, it wasn't obvious that a single person presidency was going to prevail. You know, there were very strong sentiments for monarchy among many of the uh, newly, newly independent um, countries. And most importantly, once they had become republics, they didn't immediately converge into a, um, a single person presidency. Many countries adopted a collective presidency either in rotation or in succession. But again, you know, it, it, there is nothing inevitable about it. And the other thing that's really important is that the programmatic the distinction of the, of the executive between the president and the prime minister happened only in the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, up to the, 19th, the end of the 19th century, what we observed in terms of differentiation of the executive in parliament, in, in, monarchies of Europe was the slow differentiation in the countries that happened to have been able to keep the monarchy, which meant that as this differentiation happened, the, the king or the monarch kept losing power because we know that the only reason they were able to keep the monarchy is because the king didn't rule, right? So only in Finland, during the time of the constitution, the independence in 1917, independence from Russia, and in Weimar in Germany in 1919, did this explicit idea that you have to have a president who would be holding the, 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 the state in place was, uh, I don't want to say codified, but anyway, became very explicitly advocated. So, Given the president, and um, you know, given that we settled on a president, then the question is, how are we going to uh, uh, elect this president, and who is going to elect the president? The who was very, uh, very relatively easy at that time. It you know, the legitimacy of elections was already well established, and it had to be the people in the single, right? I mean, we're talking about you know, the people of so and so elect the president, except that the people, as we know, varies a lot. You know, and certainly none of these countries, the people was conceived as being everybody or everybody under, you know, with a relatively minor limitation. Basically, you know, in a, in a line of reasoning that is compatible with a lot of studies by Saba to Banan, who's a political scientist and studied the representative government, the idea there is that there was, you know, we have the need for popular legitimacy, but we also have to make sure that we guarantee, though, you know, we make sure that those who deserve to rule are the ones who are going to be elected. And so I, I like very much the formulation that Manon has, which is pointing, calling attention to the mixed nature of elections as uh, an aristocratic and a demo simultaneously aristocratic and democratic um, um, institution, and showing that that you know the framers, both in the U.S. and England. And France were very conscious of that, and they chose elections precisely because it, they had this aristocratic um, um, aspect that allowed them to select, to make sure that not everybody would have the same chance of being elected. If that was their, their concern, and that's Manon's argument, then they would have adopted lotteries, of which they were very aware during the debates that they had. Anyway, that's not. Um, so, having established that, and I think that this is quite uncontroversial, so we went, to, you know, trying to find the reasons, if we could identify in the debates, or even in the secondary literature, uh, the reasons for why countries sorted themselves into these different uh, rules, the bottom line is that we could not. I mean, there was very, there are some debates 
constitutional uh, uh, writers, they debated virtually everything related to the presidency, including the oath of office. But amazingly, and of course, we didn't read all the constitutional debates, but from the ones we read, there is absolutely nothing that explains that they you know, lead to a debate between changing from what they had to something else. When it comes to the election, to the transition to direct elections, but I'll get there in a minute. So here we kind of, as I said, we speculate with some, with some, um, um, you know, some basis of uh, information. And what we could come up with is that indirect elections were suitable for um, um, the cases in which you had to accommodate a lot of local local powers. Um, um, well, actually, there are three kinds of arguments. The first one was that the indirect election would filter the passions of the voters. And there was a concern that if voters were allowed to go free, they would go crazy. They would be overstimulated, and they would never go to sleep, as we parents <laughs> would like to see the kids do. So they would just, you know, there is this fear that there will be too much stimulation and that something bad could come out of, of that. Um, these indirect elections, as you know, that's the point I started to make, that they ratify the power of these local elites. And this is very important because apart from the, you know, true, it may, you know, some conflict, some cleavage between the masses and the elites must have existed, and we know that they did exist, but the conflicts within the elite were perhaps more important and more divisive or more acquired exp uh, political expression more easily. So, you know, we have all these bases of cleavages that go church and state centralization, decentralization, uh, control of the, of the resources of the state, economic, you know, sectoral interests and so on and so forth. And these were very, very present in, in the, you know, in the politics of these years. And then, of course, there is the notion that and this was, you know, we saw some arenas of that, that if we had the presidential, direct presidential elections, large territory units would dominate, right? They would have the most number of people and whatever happened. And so the, the small units, they opposed. I mean, this, we know the story in the US and that's, you know, important, uh, but it also happened in, in several Latin American countries. So between electors and legislators, I mean, the, 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 the choice was really not predetermined, but it wasn't hard. I mean, as I said, only three countries had a constitution in Latin America with legislative elections of president. And, and, and the reason for, and that was one of the strongest arguments in Philadelphia. And the reason is that an election by Congress would immediately violate the separation of powers, uh, which was at that point, something that was very much of the, in the mind of the constitutional makers. Jose Antonio Aguilar Rivera, a Mexican, has an interesting book with an argument that the kind of, I mean, this was, the, 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 the separation of power was the aspect of the, of the separation of powers doctrine that pervaded through the Latin American constitutions as opposed to the checks and balances. And that introduced a rigidity that oh, I know has all sorts of arguments, but you can see that, you know, for people who were aware of this debate and the need to separate the powers, having the Congress uh, choosing the president was not a good thing. Now, we were expecting to find a lot of evidence for like some clamor for direct presidential elections. We found none. So they were instituted first in 1840 in Bolivia not direct, decisive, but conditionally, conditionally decisive, which then Bolivia, with some reversals, kept all the way to 2005. Um, but at the same time that Bolivia adopted that, it reduced the size of the electorate, not necessarily to, for economic reasons, but to create some kind of a more enlightened electorate, to, to weed out all those that have, um, um, penetrated the, the, you know, past the walls that they should not have um, passed. Of course, the transition to direct uh, election for, by the, you know, the logic of the previous argument hurt the small provinces and they did 
Uh, some of them did uh, a complain. Of course, they benefited from the malapportment of every one Congress that exists. As I was writing these slides a couple of days ago, it occurred to me that it would be interesting to compare the malapportment of the pre of the indirect election with the direct uh, of the Congress in the under the direct elections to see if the small provinces really lost something. We know that a lot of this Congress post direct elections remain quite malapportioned, but the data are really not easy to get. Um, and importantly, we we didn't find a lot of systematic evidence that the small provinces were were complaining a lot. So they also. Uh, uh, direct elections were part of the impetus toward centralization, right? So they, in this sense, they hurt the small, the small provinces. Um, um, you know, as Sabato says, you know, I'll, I'll let her say what he says. And uh, um, um, anyway, the interesting thing that we found is that by the end of the 19th century, all countries, or well, 90% of the countries in Latin America had overcome the distaste for um, indirect elections. I mean, they had all adopted some kind of direct, of direct elections. The criticism of the US model of the electors was very early in the Constitutional Convention in Ecuador in 1830. There is already references to the corrupt way of electing, corrupt in the partisan sense, way of electing presidents. In the 1891 convention in Brazil, it was like a huge topic of debate and everybody like piling up against, against the U.S. Interestingly, Argentina was, was also the laggard on that in 1994. They you know, changed and now they have a two-round system in the U.S., of course, is the only country that still adopts the system. And anyway, we're going to finish with that. Just one thing about to eliminate, you know, we couldn't really find support for anything, but we could eliminate some possibilities. And one of them was diffusion. I mean, it was, you know, it's easy to think that, you know, one country adopted presidential, direct presidential election and everybody else did, but the temporal pattern doesn't really conform um, with that. And a lot of the president presidents were supposed to be elected directly according to the constitution. They were actually elected by the constituent assembly. So the pattern in, in Ecuador, 16 of those presidents were elected by the constituent assembly. So there was a coup, the president would come in, call a new constitution, you know, re revoke the constitution, call for a new constitutional assembly, which would establish direct election for president for the next president, whereas that person was just confirmed in power by the constituent assembly. That person would not have would not last in power, and therefore the next president would do the same thing. It wasn't successive, 16, but total uh, it was. So one puzzle that we could not find any argument for is that why on earth would they choose plurality? Right? I mean. It, it makes no sense. I mean, it, it's something that, you know, it's easy to see. I put this here for the non-political scientists, but, you know, it's easy to see that if you have a plurality system with three candidates or more, you can very well, and historically you did have cases in which a majority of the people actually prefer somebody else. So that kind of delegitimizes whatever, the, the system. So the question is why? One possibility, but that's just, you know, was speculating because we don't find evidence, is that people really thought, I mean, they were not aware either because there was some prepotence, because they felt like they were able to control the masses, or because they looked at the experience of these electoral colleges and, and electors, and they found that very seldom did they have to go to Congress. In elections with electors, you know, I, I didn't explain that, but if electors did not, you know, the result of, think like this. You, you're a country, 10 provinces in 1840, and you have to elect a president. In a system in which each province will have, a, you know, choose some electors without any coordination. 
right? So you don't know who's gonna, you know, nobody's gonna emerge as, as the winner, very clearly. So elections would go to Congress. In Congress, then they would have several ways of, um, 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 you know, there would be different rules about how to close the election. You can vote five times, you don't vote, you know, if you five times you don't get it, then it goes to a much lower threshold and things like that, that force the, the election. But the history of it, with the data that you could get, because amazingly, you cannot find data on the election of the, you know, the, the primary election. I mean, who was elected to elect the president? I mean, this is law, I think it's lost for history. Michelle, you have to tell your students to go look for them. Yes. That's something that uh, we should do. But anyway, given the data we have, we find that in an overwhelming majority of cases, they were able to produce a majority, which then might have led them to think, well, that's not going to be a problem. We don't need, really need to, you know, we're not that divided. So we're just going to. Um, now, that's I like this story because it, so that's the last one, actually very close to the end, which is good. Um, the adoption of the two-round majority, which you know, today retrospective, we think is like you know, so obvious that you know it works so well, produces a clear winner, people are happy, and yada yada. It was very convoluted. The first time that it was used was in Weimar in 1925 as the result of a law that was passed by parliament in 1920. It was not part of the constitution. It was the most berserk and crazy system. And by no means, it wasn't a good system and it was not the system that is adopted today. So here's the, I mean, that's, it's good for us to think what could have been history if the rules were slightly different. Okay. So the rule was, you first have an, an election, if nobody, uh, uh, you know, popular, if nobody gets a majority, then you have a second round. So far, so good, right? However, between the first and the second round, there are two things. The first is that anybody can come in. So anybody can come in and present themselves. And second, which is crazy, the criterion for winning was less strict that in the second round than the criterion for winning the first round. So all you needed was a plurality. Guess who came into, into the race in the second round and won with just a plurality? Who? Who? Hindenburg, right? So had the system been a little bit better, Hindenburg would not have won or probably not have come into the, the thing. So it was a crazy system that, you know, Austria in 1939, when they reformed the constitution, created this system, but for a number of reasons, by this system, I mean the, the modern one, two rounds with absolute majority in the second, I mean, as the criterion, and the top two in the second round. Austria, but it didn't implement it until 1951, between coups, uh, Nazism, and, and Stand, you know, ideas that they didn't have enough money to run elections of that sort, that I think was in 31 and 33, they decided they didn't use it until 51. Costa Rica established it in 1936, but didn't actually use it until 1948. A lot of African countries in the early 1960s adopted the two round and you know, there is a debate between the three of us because some of them think that it was because of France, except that in France, the system was not that. I mean, the system of, of the 58 uh, constitution was an indirect election with a huge electoral college and, and no direct participation of voters because there would be a, a lot of people who are like administrators of localities and so on who would just be an uh, Post-military dictatorship in Latin America, this could be, you know, it could claim it's a bit of diffusion, but you know, who cares, right? But everybody kind of <laughs> saw the light and saw that a lot of the problems that existed prior to the military intervention could be solved if you didn't have a president without time. And then you have today, as we saw, parliamentary democracies that are adopted. I'm not predicting that parliamentary democracies are all going to have presidential elections. What I do predict 
is that no country that becomes a democracy for the first time or today, very few of them, or who decides to have a parliamentary regime face on the rare occasion when the presidential system becomes a parliamentary system, democracy, no country will adopt an indirect presidential election. A lot of political scientists try to make this into a, another political system, the semi-presidential system. This is not, I mean, I will strongly argue that this is not, a, I mean, it didn't emerge as the result of a well-thought consideration of what the optimal way to divide the executive. It emerged from the need of, um, if you're gonna have somebody with some power, this somebody has to be elected. There is no way not to elect this people. Now, I'm gonna spend two minutes here. Here's outcomes. First of all, for people who don't care, don't care because I don't really trust this. For people who care, don't trust this because this is a very rough uh, uh, you know, set of regressions, just in part because we wanted to publish this in a political science journal. And no political science journal will take it without a little regression. <laughs> and it, it's like a model of nothing. I mean, you control for GDP and the period of interwar to see if, you know, to try to control for some founders. And the outcomes we use are, you know, outcomes that we had handy. You know, there is really, all, the, 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 the presumption here is that we establish that there may be something, and if somebody wants to do a more serious study of this issue, then they are welcome. And I think it may pay off, but we, you know, that was already too much in the paper. So just to conclude, you know, I just said that only parliamentary democracies have this kind of system in which voters do not have a decisive vote, and that's another debate among the three of us. I find that that's a tension, you know, and I, I would like us to have addressed that in a better way, because it is, you know, just think about the most democratic of the parliamentary systems. You can name it, some country in Europe. Voters have no say on who is going to be governing. They are, you know, those people are limited, they're constrained, but, you know, in, in multi-party systems, who knows? Who, you know, we kind of know, but we kind of don't know, right? But anyway, that's an issue we decide not to talk about. There are no good arguments to support keeping the rules as they are in the cases of the United States, I forgot to say. Um, yeah, the U.S. is the only one that does, and the, you know, as we all know here, and that's the not so optimistic tone. I mean, chances that this thing in the U.S. is going to be. I mean, there is widespread recognition in the practice of the world, in the thinking of almost everybody, that this institution does not work. You know, a, 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 a period in which. The ruler may actually be somebody who are not the choice of the people. It's kind of crazy in this day and age. And yet there is no prospect that this is gonna change peacefully. I don't know about, you know, I, I, I put my money on the status quo. I don't think there'll be a civil war, but anyway, that's what I have to say. <laughs> I think we can open yeah. questions and I can take the question. Sure. Yeah. And I have one <laughs> that's really started. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Yeah. Well, thanks. I mean, I found this fascinating also because of the different ways of thinking about past and model thing. But one of the things that I found interesting was to, to think over time about your model of who, um, how to elect, but especially by whom. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the by whom has any influence on the shape of the elections, meaning, you know, women couldn't vote mm -hmm. for most of this period. So this, and yeah. also I just, I was thinking in the Brazilian case, uh, from 1881 to 1985 or eight, illiterate people couldn't vote. Yeah. So it yeah. just reduces the amount of. So by whom, in that sense, yes. If what is the influence on the model? 
And also, if there is any restrictions on, and I think there is, but who could be elected? Mm. Oh, and yeah. also because that's this wasn't part of the, no. yeah. the chart, but I, I was wondering if over time <clears throat> the question of who who can be elected has also no. an impact on the indirect direct. No, no I mean it's, it's, this is I mean this is absolutely right. I mean in terms of who could I mean I I I haven't really thought about the effect of the the, the suffrage on the rule. But one thing I can say, and I think you know that, is that the, the, the suffrage wasn't as narrow as we tend to think it was. So in many Latin American countries, particularly in the beginning, like Mexico had, you know, right after independent, after the empire, had a very broad suffrage that kept being narrowed through the century and to get to Bolivia. But so the, the, when you have the system of primary and secondary voters, the primary voters, the suffrage was very broad. And it was very local, as we've read, and a lot of historians have written about that, like the way that voters were registered, the vicinities, and you know, things like that. But the secondary voters, they were absolutely restricted, you know, in terms of age, in terms of income, in terms of um, um, all sorts of things. I mean, gender. In in Brazil, when they abolished the, the income requirement, they immediately introduced an education requirement, and the correlation between the two was probably 0.99. So it didn't make any difference in the size of it. If anything, it reduced the size of the electorate. But I don't know about how that would have influenced the, I mean, Bolivia is an interesting case when they they put they broaden I mean they make the suffrage direct, but they narrow the electorate, which was much broader until it did fall. Uh, keep looking at Michelle because he knows what he knows all those things. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I don't know how I would. Uh, I see Scott, but Michelle had a. His hand oh, first. Yeah, he's a great question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let me ask the question before I start with the shame. Um, now, what's so great is that, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, this database, the data set that you have is pretty unusual, right? Of space and time. Uh, and so I, you know, just out of curiosity, I wondered what was the most counterintuitive finding for the three of you? But before, and, you know, if you hear your last slide, you'd say, oh, the U.S. is the outlier, so many of the exceptions. So I think we know that the U.S. political system is pretty damn old um, in many different ways. Oh, you said old? Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to say bad, but <laughs> synonymous in this case. I'll leave that up to Scott. Um, but um, I mean, for, for me personally, the Bolivian case is actually fascinating mm -hmm. because, you know, if you see this as a form of political modernity, it's the first one in 1840, but it is also considered among a number of historians to be the place where the colonial legacies weigh the most. Mm -hmm. So you have what historians call the colonial pact. That is, the Republican order can emerge out of you know, these bloody wars of independence in Bolivia because these Republican elites make a pact with indigenous communities. They, they respect their autonomy. Um, there's also a fiscal arrangement, but the, the point I'm trying to make here is that they see this sort of as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as still being rooted in colonialism. So the colonial pact. Well, but there's a change. Yes. And yet it's this precisely, this kind of hybrid political system where colonialism, according to scholars, weighs a lot that produces this, this innovation. Yeah, yeah. So is that is that? I mean, for me, that would be the most surprising thing. But I, I just go back. Um, since you guys have so much data over so much space and, and especially time, I'd be curious to know what, what you found. I mean, the most, well, the most surprising fact was the Weimar Constitution. I mean, the election, nineteen twenty-five. I was floored by that because I couldn't think that it would be so stupid. Have a, I do know, I asked a, a number of people about the origins of that system, and one colleague from Norway said that 
a lot of legislative elections in Norway, in um, um, Denmark, or in Scandinavia in general, they were like that. And the idea was that, it, I mean, so, so first there are legislative elections. So the, the stakes are much lower. But the idea is that you get like a reading of the preferences. And that's exactly what happened in Weimar because the candidate of the right in the first round did pretty badly. And, but the reasons because the right belonged to Hindenburg in the first round. So they went with this alternative. When the social democratic candidate became the presumed winner in a second round, then they mobilized to bring Hindenburg in. And, and, and so given the information on the first round, they're able to devise a strategy for the second round, except that we're talking about the presidency of a whole country and not of a district, of an electoral district. But that, that's according to this friend is the origin of this. But anyway, it's funny in this paper because I feel like on the one hand, there aren't many surprising findings, but there are other surprising findings. I was surprised by Bolivia in 1840. I read that's the country I read a little bit more than the others because precisely because of that fact. And I found, so, the reason I say that I wasn't surprised is because a lot of the thing that I took in, my motivation was conducive to me not being surprised for the following reason. Part of the, my motivation for this is to, you know, one thing that I, bothers me when I hear political scientists use or invoke this, this idea that either what happened in North America in the 19th century was just a copy of the US, or it was just, you know, a bunch of deeply authoritarian people who didn't know how to govern. And, you know, so nobody says that anymore in, in, with these words, but it's implicit in a lot of what they say. So one of the, my motivation is to understand why is it that in spite of everything, and it's not as if force is not present, right? I mean, we know that it is. In Ecuador, you know, the guy came in, ousted somebody with some coalition, became the president, wrote a new constitution, put himself in, legitimized his power, and then was out, out overthrown again. But the, 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 what is fascinating is they kept using elections. You know, and in this sense, they were right there with Europe and the United States. You know, and so there is this movement of like uh, othering North America, with respect to the so-called West. But I think this othering is a little bit too much because this process of election happened. I mean, I, you know, what, one way for you to look at what happened in Europe during the 19th century. Kings or monarchs were powerful. They called the shots, they imposed legislation, they imposed their ministries, and they removed the Congress. One pattern that is now, you know, super common in Europe is this. The king switches the prime minister, dissolves the assembly, and produces a majority. That's very much like the Ecuadorian pattern with a different institutional structure. So anyway, so my motivation, I mean, it's not like, as I'm saying, I can normalize it, but my motivation is to understand why is it, if it is true that there was this this the social structure was conducive to war and you know everything negative you know about North America. I mean, there is a history of elections and you know at least attempting to solve these conflicts. Uh, you know, that, I don't think so. Scott, sorry. No. Now that you disclosed about the story, I'm going to a little bit. Um, but I, I, your answer in part to this last question, especially about Hindenburg, is informative of the question I was going to ask. Um, but to, your last slide is, you know, there's no reason for this to say for this stupid system. Well, there, that's, there's no normative reason for it. There is a political reason for it, right? That there's groups that are opposed oh, to, yeah. to these changes. Oh, and yeah. You know, and so now you're talking to these answers to Michelle, where they're basically about this is where the politics that come from that lead to the changes. In some cases, it's a mobilization from below, an interest in democracy. In some cases, it was a one side or the other decided they didn't like that, and so they were able to impose the change. And that, and that maybe there's a systematic 
response to, to this of what are the aligned interests in favor of or against the current system. And I think that might be an interesting way to define in general. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree in the sense that obviously, you know, in the, I mean, that's the, that's, you know, we are restating the fact about the US, right? It doesn't change because there are people who don't want to change it. I mean, that is, yeah. but the puzzle to me is, and I still find it this is puzzling, why aren't there more people saying that it should change? I mean, because yes, I understand that any proposal for change is going to be vetoed by some minority in Congress, in any Congress you have. But why isn't the majority saying well, that? Given in a comparative context, why, why, would, why were they able to overcome those minorities in other places? No, that's a exactly. constitution is particularly hard to change. Yeah. That might be part of it. And that, I think, is, you know, I agree. It is, I mean, yeah, you can't change this thing anymore. I mean, so, but I mean, I think we're in agreement. I mean, we don't have a lot of politics here, in part because, I mean, what, what you know, JJ, you shouldn't be hearing that because you're the chair of my department. <laughs> but if I could, I would just take one country and go to some archive and keep reading this stuff. Well, you know, <laughs> you just can hire me there. <laughs> but anyway, it's I I I would it's reading these debates. It's fascinating. I mean, like just and this is like we're reading without a lot of context. But precisely, you know, because we're trying to read as many as we can, but, you know, to folk, like take Bolivia and read this constitution, I mean, it's with more politics, yeah. So I'm so glad I'm a geographer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, going back to that thing that you told us not to pay attention to, oh. with the useless GP, uh, GDP and all of that, yep. I was wondering if the, the data that you have any information on population in general, and if there is any correlation between the size of the population and the political model, and, and how we go from, from there. Not only the size of the population, but also the size of the the political dominant population, which yeah. is in Congress, and, and adjacent. I mean, that we don't have data on who is dominating each segment of the population. We do have data, we could get data on population. We didn't do a correlation in this data set. My experience working with you know, other data that's related, but with a different period, is that there, there is no, the correlation is not very strong. I mean, not between democracy and dictatorship, um, and not between parliamentary and presidential systems, which was the one that I think would be more intuitive to think that they were, because, you know, but then you have the West and you have India and Canada, which are parliamentary. So, you know, I, I, I don't think so. But more grains data about the population, yeah, but then we start getting to the territory of like, we don't know. <laughs> Uh, so I was wondering, you've heard of me to comment a bit about uh, some of your presidentialism. Yes. <laughs> you knew some of <laughs> So um, could you talk a bit about sort of that, you know, kind of the, where that factored into, you know, sort of research and sort of the development of that system? I mean, obviously that, you know, kind of dates to France in 62, yeah. you know, sort of moving forward from, from that and thinking about sort of the adoption of... I mean, I... I don't think, I don't, I mean, the, 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 the semi-presidential model, right? I mean, it has to do with the uh, Virgil, right? And I think, I think we may have jumped too fast into, into, the, into the bandwagon of, of semi-presidentialism because to my knowledge, they, I mean, this is what I learned by reading a little bit about Finland and about Weimar. Right, there was, you know, the, it's a, the, the origins of the presidents in this system, but it's terrible. Like the right wanted the president, wanted a strong president because they liked the monarch and they wanted to replace the monarch with the president. The, um, the, uh, uh, and the left wanted a pure parliamentary system. In Germany, it was very clear, the debate was very much like there is the US model, there is the French model, and then we're going to go in the middle. But just because, I mean, but not 
there was, to my knowledge, I mean, I don't read German, but to what I read was you know, very filtered, but to my knowledge, there was no discussion of like, what, you know, what should we give to the president? If you look at the existing presidential system, there is a very interesting paper that does the following, takes all the presidents uh, in Europe, I guess, and, and, and calls the powers, the effective powers of indirectly elected and, and directly elected president. The whole literature, yeah. <laughs> the whole literature on presidential, on civil presidentialism says that um, we, we would expect that the presidents, the systems with directly elected presidents would have stronger presidents. Basically what they find is that there are cases in all four boxes. Indirectly elected who are strong, directly elected who are weak, and that are you know the other dynamic. So it's a it's something that I think evolved in terms of the legitimacy of you know if you're killing in you know, King, if you're getting rid of the monarch, then it, and you're gonna have somebody out there. I mean, it's it has to be, I mean, today it has to be direct. In Eastern Europe, and that's true of every country. I mean, Czech Slovakia had indirect and went into direct now. Um, so, I mean, I think it's more absurd, absurd, I mean, how to say that? Yeah. Half <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyway, it's it's not a programmatic thing. There is true, it's very heterogeneous. Because mm -hmm. so. you do see, like, in, just the, like the comment in Eastern Europe, you do see this sort of like, Transition immediately, and then the first pass was to semi presidential mm -hmm. or parliamentary or you know, presidential, and then, you know, sort of moving towards presidential. So, become, you know, sort of becoming. No, they moved in the opposite. Well, some are moving in the opposite, but you did see it beginning. But they all adopted parliamentary. Yeah. In the sense that they all had a government that depended on the confidence of the assembly, whether with a direct or indirect. Because the, the communist constitutions were parliamentary constitutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, and, and the, my line is that you know, the best predictor of a con today's constitution is yesterday's constitution. You know? and, and this, you know, is, yeah. is, I mean, I think this is a fact. But so they just kept what they had. Mm -hmm. And they already had some experience with parliamentary from the interwar period. Right. So, anyway. Yeah. Wait, there is some more questions. Yeah. No, so I don't know how many of this because I've been trying to like think through it for a while, but I think even this idea of like looking at the population or something, mm -hmm. I, I think like it might be interesting to look more in not just like population, but like level of education and um I don't know, like I guess gene or something making to that. Because like what I was thinking is like the normative reason why you would want electors is because the population is for identity. Right, like they would, they would actually spin that or sort of like sell it. So, like, a change towards getting rid of lectures would be something making to well, now actually, our population is well prepared to deal with democracy. And I think that's some, like interesting. It's just like a purely devil's advocate because I don't believe this at all, but you could make the argument that populism is a problem that electors could potentially deal with. Right, of course, I don't think you would leave them in the one country that disproves this. Problem. Yeah, exactly. So, I agree. I just think this so why would I need the devil's advocate? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, but I think it might be interesting to see that the reason why you sort of like move normatively towards saying, okay, this idea of lectures actually, you know, why people are ready for dealing with their own democracy, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I. I mean, I, I, I do believe, I mean, I, I believe that they are ready from day one, but yeah, yeah. I also know, we all know that people really believe that they were not, and some people still believe that. <laughs> um, part of the problem is that, I mean, like, there are, all, there are hundreds of interesting questions to ask, but there is, like, minus three possibilities of getting the data that you need to look at it in that context, right? I mean, Gini, I mean, I don't believe in genies going to 1945. Am I going to believe in anybody who calculates a genie of Paraguay in 1950? Right? right? <laughs> so we all go with the generic inequality was very high. And um, yeah, th there are lots of, of things. But I mean, the, the one thing that I felt disappointed with my fellow historians 
is the, I mean, on the one hand, there is an incredible, I mean, which I learned in part, and learn more, like doing incredible research on elections in Latin America, right? I mean, old, but mentioning. You know, um, but they didn't do enough, and there is this problem, and this problem is of political science, it's of historians. We have, you know, we TA'd 500 years ago, and we had this discussion about like what politi political scientists would think. But I mean, they, people, were, they didn't pay attention to the little institutional details. You know, so what we need are monographs that somebody who are, who is really willing to go and dig, I mean, with the electors, I mean, it'll be great to know the results of one, you know, very well studied election in which we know who was, you know, how many people voted in each province, who was elected, how do they come together? Sometimes we don't even know if the electoral college is ad hoc or, or standing. We don't even know if they actually met because the constitution says that they remit the results to the Congress in the capital, which means that they may not even have met, like in the US. Can I just briefly respond? That's why I think the data, the data that you guys are collecting is so important because the easy answer to your question, why, why historians haven't done that, is because for a long time, historians thought elections didn't matter. I know. Yeah. And then we've got someone like Mila Salafo, I don't know if you read her last book, Mila Salafo, you know, who talks more about elections, more in, a, in terms of context political culture. So she's not that interested yeah. in the kind of question or the data that you're looking for, but she does uh, recuperate the importance mm -hmm. of elections. Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually someone who got a PhD here, James Sanders. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. uh, who writes about how Latin America in the 19th century said the political vanguard in the Atlantic precisely because of the kind of elections that get played out mm -hmm. and, and participation. Yeah. But um, so I think that's that's part of the problem. Yeah. Um, but having worked on the 1850s, it is very hard to get at the data for these for because okay. Nicaragua had that system in the mm -hmm. 1850s. And Walker, believe it or not, is the one who institutes this is U.S. imperialist expansions, is the one who institutes popular uh, the conditional election. Like, no, yeah, he, he, he abolishes the, the electoral college and then in one of the first time direct elections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so I was interested in looking at the electors, and it's it's really, really oh, fun because I mean, they do sometimes. Uh, the newspapers produce these 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 the outcomes, but then you get at the issue of well, how do you get your hands on these newspapers? Many of them. Oh man! Them. <laughs> so what you so I think it's partly a, a, a more recent shift yeah, that yeah. elections do matter. That's why I think your database is really important. Like yeah. just Bolivia at first, even for I mean, we have a Bolivian center. <laughs> yeah. They don't think. <laughs> yes, <for a> <laughs> but I don't think she would she would know this. Really? Because I think so. I mean, we know about Bensu, uh -huh. but he's Bensu's later is late late forties, I think. So I don't think it's eighteen forty. But you know, because the way in which people study Bolivia, it's all about colonialism, about yeah. indigenous history. or or political. I mean, I don't know historians, but political scientists is like about the instability. Oh, oh yeah, that. Yeah. It's the most unstable country in Latin yeah. America. Oh, they kill yeah, they're actually yeah, they're more groups than uh, than years of Republican rule. The um. Uh, Honduras in eighteen forty also had with Bolivia that kind of election. We tried to go after. I mean, Bolivia. We relied on the work of um, Iridia, this guy. Huh? Yeah. Spain. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, which is very interesting. But uh, for Honduras, we couldn't find anything. And we had a reference to some newspaper that had we didn't even know the result of the election. And we had some newspaper that. Uh, we knew it would have had. We went after it. I mean, like with the librarian and with the, it doesn't exist. I mean, like it's you know, it's a newspaper, right? Somebody should have it. Somebody claims to have it, but nobody can see it. So you know, anyway, it's but it's fascinating. It's, I mean, it's, oh, anyway. Well, um, thank you very much. Well, thank you guys. Thank you all for the next um, events that we are um, hosting right here two weeks from today.
Um, we are partnering with the uh, Center for African Studies and the History Department on a series on slavery and memorization in the Atlantic world. And um, in October 19, we're having the round table on slavery and memorialization in Brazil. And then on um, one later on October 26, we're having also a discussion on Brazil with Black City, Slave City, um, with Roden Fisher, which is a professor at the University of Chicago. Thank you. Cool. Here again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.